Welcome to the DaVinci Hour podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Maxwell Cooper, and in this podcast series, I interview physicians, medical innovators, and entrepreneurs making an impact on healthcare. This podcast is produced by DaVinci Academy, a multimedia medical education company that provides podcasts, video courses, and digital textbooks. You can see more on our website, www.dviacademy.com, and our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C slash DaVinci Academy Med. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the DaVinci Hour podcast. I'm honored this week to be joined by Dr. Kathy Fields, a dermatologist in the San Francisco Bay Area, who's also a serial entrepreneur, the co-founder of Proactive, and then now Rodan and Fields. So Dr. Fields, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So Dr. Fields, I gave you a little bit of an intro. Why don't you give us uh, maybe a little bit of background on yourself, like where you went to school, where you did your residency training, and a little bit about your current practice right now. You mean the short story? Okay. First, I want to thank you for having me. And the Da Vinci are, oh my God, that's Da Vinci is the most interesting person in the world. If you look back at all the biggest brains, you can probably start with Einstein, but without question, you've chosen wisely. Da Vinci is my hero, all time greatest in every aspect, uh, particularly with circulation, flow, physics, flight. You know, we can get into the war toys and his music skills and the things he did, but of the greatest minds there. So there's a book I'd like to recommend. Sure. So first, Walter Isaacson, Da Vinci, Leonardo Da Vinci, and you'll learn down to the price of his pantyhose, uh, how he lived and, and died. But go to Leonard Schlein's book. Leonard Schlein was a physician across the hall from me, sadly, who died of a brain cancer. But Leonard wrote an amazing book about Da Vinci, and he oh, had really? a very interesting surprise about the brain and the corpus callosum, and a theory about Leonardo da Vinci. Well worth the read, little book. So that's the first question. Now let's go back in time. I'm from nowhere. I'm from Waukegan, Illinois. Waukegan, Illinois is a little spot above Chicago, just south of the Wisconsin border. So in my era, my uh, three siblings and myself all got out of high school fast in three years and went on because our parents told us we could be any kind of doctor we wanted all four of us are physicians. So we're four for four. My sister, a year older, wow. is a cardiologist. My twin brother, who has passed away, was a dermatologist. And my little brother, 10 years younger, is the emergency room physician. So that's why we had to be doctors. So I went to, uh, to University of Florida, and I got into exactly one medical school, the University of Miami. So wow. that's uh, interesting for people out there because it only takes one school. Absolutely. <laughs> so that was the start. Now at the University of Miami, I had done research in dermatology, but I was already an OBGYN and I love OBGYN. It's to me in my old age, it's still my hobby with my patients and my practice. So I have a special interest. So at that era, the years 1983, 84, when I applied to dermatology, there were five women in the program, small program, but five of them and all five were pregnant. Wow. So they said to me when I applied, are you going to have a baby? I said, you know, it's a great idea, but I'm not married. Chances <laughs> don't look good for the next four years. Anyway, I didn't get in, but I did get into Stanford. And uh, so what happens, of course, when you get into a, a great residency program, you stick. So I'm still out here in California. I'm still adjunct clinical faculty at UCSF and at Stanford. That's awesome. Yeah, that's that's an amazing story. I mean, it's it's kind of funny how these opportunities find our way, you yep. know, find their way to us in, in life. So that's really cool. And that's very inspiring. You know, like you said, it only takes one med school. Uh, you know, there's there, it's amazing how many really successful physicians I've out I've met out there that, you know, they they there was only one school that took them. And that's like you said, that's all it takes. Um, so that's very inspiring. So, you know, despite your all your entrepreneurial endeavors, from what I understand, you're still in clinical practice, uh, at least uh, somewhat now. Um, I'm curious, you know, is there any particular area of dermatology you focus on? Is there any particular patient population you focus on? And I guess what's kept you going to, to keep practicing all this time? Uh, curiosity. So that's number one. Also a, a Leonardo trait. <laughs> uh, so 
first of all, the, the first question Katie and I got, so Katie Rodan is my co-founder uh, with Proactive Solutions, so that's a story I can tell. But going way back when that first really was successful, the first question we'd get is, why are you still practicing? And, and of course, everybody knows a dermatologist doesn't sit on a beach, right? right. So we kept going. Uh, we had invented way back then, the year was 1995, when Proactive launched. So I graduated med school in 83, internship, residency, 87. Um, so when we launched, uh, we had figured out a paradigm shift in the treatment of acne. Before Katie and I, for the masses, you would spot treat after the fact. That's reactive. Or my husband, the dentist would say, why brush your teeth after the cavity? That's ridiculous. You wanna prevent the problem. So we took that to heart really. And we used three medicines, low strength, full face every day. So instead of 10% benzoyl proxy that burns the skin, we brought it down to 2.5. In fact, we had read studies where even 1% is effective. The trick though is to use it every day and prevent the process in the skin. So we took that successful paradigm and we brought it into several new uh, products uh, for brown spots, for rosacea, for aging, for sensitive skin, and we made different regimens. And as it turned out, the first company wasn't interested. How interesting, huh? <laughs> Gave them literally a billion dollar brand and they go, no, no, you do acne. We said, no, no, we, we do hair, skin, and nails. We can do it all. So we began um, you know, working on the next project, which uh, then went to Estee Lauder. So Estee Lauder bought our second product line, but they didn't know what to do with it. And so for your entrepreneurs out there, when you can get a big success in one area, that formula doesn't always translate into all the different markets. So they, we were in direct sales with Proactive Solution from 1995 till 19, uh, excuse me, to 2016. That's a great, great run. And wow. then it was by Galderma. Um, but things change. There's always change. And the company we were with got the ranker, which is a turnkey. So what does that mean? Katie and I licensed our concept Proactive. Remember, you don't know anything about business. You're doctors. And man, those business people are very tough and they're very difficult. And we can go into that deeper about what they expect and need from us as entrepreneurs. But a turnkey where they do it all was a perfect start for us as we were getting into the business world. And they did a brilliant job. Guthy Rinker was outstanding in the way they marketed it. If you remember, you guys are pretty young. Um, we had every movie star from Justin Bieber, um, Jessica Simpson, Alicia Keys, Adam Levine, I mean, Diddy, and I won't tell you all the stories behind <laughs> the scenes there, but I will tell you, it was an interesting time. But we never gave up our integrity. We never gave up our high value. We didn't let them corrupt our products and try to put coconut oil in because it was uh, trending. So you've got to hang on to your values, vision, and integrity as the founder because people who are helping you in the business do not know what you know, and they can take a great idea and kill it uh, because they're following money. Generally, us medical people, we're following health. We want real results all the time. And I want you to maintain that bar as you think of ideas that you're interested in doing. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And thanks for giving us that, that overview of proactive. I mean, that's, I, I've used, I used proactive products when I was younger, as I'm sure many of my listeners have as well. Um, so you guys really, you know, transformed skincare in that, in that regard, uh, which is just amazing. I'm curious, you know, those early years, you know, you, you were looking, it sounds like you were looking for, you know, a better product for, you weren't happy with what was out there for, you know, right. specifically acne. So that was essentially the clinical need. It sounds like, I guess. So how did you get those first few steps? I mean, you, you and your, your partner, Dr. Rodan are, you know, practicing dermatologists. You've recently completed residency. Like you said, no business training. I mean, how did you even start doing this? It's, it's, it's just amazing. <laughs> well, there's something called a library. Remember those? Um, <laughs> we had one. <laughs> we had a medical library. And first, the problem. The problem it has to be identified. You have to have a real need. If you have something completely obscure where the patient themselves or the person doesn't know to self-identify, you've got a big problem because it's going nowhere. A good example, there's a, a new breakthrough medication, pharmaceutical, that means the script for um, perigonodularis, picker's nodules, 
Oh, I know what that is. But I can tell you, the masses have no clue what that is. And to them, it looks like a tumor. It's a firm brownish pink bump on a leg, on an arm. And so they can't self-diagnose and, and treat. It's not going to happen. Where acne, it's a four-letter word. It's spelled U-G-L-Y. Everybody knows if you have it. And the need to remove it is fierce. Sure. And so as a result, pick a problem that's big, not obscure. When you go after it, find the blue ocean. So Katie and I realized in our era, healthcare changed from going to any doctor you wanted. They paid the visit and the meds. Oh, think of it. And it became HMO. Overnight, our practice was lost. Why? If I was the internist and I had five get out of you know jail passes, I would give it to my heart patients or cancer, but I'm not sending anybody for acne. So what happened is people are starting to scar. Their only opportunity was in the grocery store and they didn't know what to do. That's called the paradox of choice. You walk into Walgreens and there's a wall of products and you're stuck, you just can't move forward. I know what's in them. And I look at the ingredient decks and go, wow, this is confusing. So we identified a huge need, by the way, they, we were after adult women with acne because Insurance would not cover you over 18. So there's a, a lie and a myth that you grow out of it. Not true. They said 3% of adult women have acne. We decided all of them live in San Francisco or they are missing a large market. We, of course, were correct. The number can be up to 50% of us over the age of 20 have acne. I'm 64. I still break out. So it's common. Number two, uh, we, start, we did our research. We identified the problem. We figured out our formula for success, which is all the topical ingredients, but used at better um, strengths that they could tolerate. And we did a really big difference. We put it in the Clinique paradigm. Clinique, if you go back into the 80s, had a one, two, three step. And they had number, one, two, three. So you know what to do, cleanse, tone, lotion, sunscreen. So we created, because the OTC monograph, over-the-counter monograph, does not allow mixing of benzoyl peroxide with sulfur with cell acid. We leaded each of our formulas. We made them feel good and smell good. That's called compliance. Now, this was Katie and I's secret sauce. We, we thought we were going to have an esthetician create the formulas. It actually took us four years to find a, a, a great lab in New York, um, real geniuses. Uh, to create the formulas we wanted, but we knew exactly how it should feel and smell on the skin, that it could work with makeup uh, or with men and everyone would be able to use it without burning. So we had a high bar and we finally got formulas made and we did clinical studies out of our offices. But Katie and I are unique in this way. And this is where the, I wanna talk to your doctors on the line. We know the pathophysiology of the disease we're looking at. We know the patient suffering Big business didn't know that acne is a lousy disease. They thought it was unimportant. They literally, when we went to Neutrogena, they said, who cares about acne? And I can tell you stories. I'm gonna give you goosebump stories about acne and how important it is, not just to the person suffering, but to the family around them and the impact on a community. So we knew the pathophysiology, we knew the consumer, we ourselves are users of skincare, so we understood uh, use in general for different age groups. And we understood business. You know, we, we were learning quick. And so you have, you know, you're didactic. You can go anywhere now and get a at-home business course um, and start learning uh, EBITDA and your bottom line and, you know, KPIs. I can throw letters at you all day. That was sign language when we started. But now you can access it all. And you must, because as an entrepreneur, you just do not understand the business side of it. And you really need someone you can trust to jump in with a project. And then that leads me to mentors. Mentors, people who have been through it are important to have at your fingertips early and often, because you may think you have a really cool, great idea and they will help you test that concept. They will help you understand where the competition is. That's called the red ocean. Who else is doing what you're doing? And I do not want to hear another Me Too product. I am a mentor for lots of different ideas and startups and people. And you can't be another Dr. Pimple Popper. There is one. Do something different. So that's like immediately somebody would say to me, well, I could do that. Well, you're too late. Mm -hmm. Be the first. Be in the forefront. Or you're just an ankle biter just 
trying to get some scraps that whatever the, the lead in that position has. Sure. Sure. So I'm curious, you know, did you guys have to put this through a clinical trial? What, what was the, like the regulatory and the approval process? Like how, how did that go? No regulatory. When you're dealing with over the counter, you have to be formulary. You can't mm-hmm. put retin-A with, uh, or a tretinoin in with benzoyl peroxide. That is not a legal combination. So you, you need to know your science and what's allowed under the monograph, the OTC monograph. So if you work within the monograph, we could put a label and sell it tomorrow or in today's world online right now. Oh, wow. Um, but what we did, we did a clinical trial for ourselves just to prove proof of concept. We wanted to be sure that we weren't overdoing it, that there was compliance. In fact, the biggest thing we found, this was crazy. We did a focus group behind the glass where we were eating the M&Ms and yeah, like 20 women playing with the product. And we invited them because they had five pimples a month. They had acne. They were told it's an acne study. When they were in the, in the, behind the glass, they all decided they don't have acne. All of them. Oh, we don't have acne. I have blemishes. I have period breakouts. I, they had a different language for what we were trying to treat. And they, we went fragrance-free because we want to be dermatologists. They hated that. They needed a non-sensitizing masking fragrance. But once you study the group and get into their mindset, you learn a tremendous amount. So yes, we did clinical study for ourselves. Yes, we did focus group testing. Yes, we did it in the end, our own marketing, business plan, packaging. The packaging was the most exciting. That was the most expensive. This is the real, believe it or not, in the year 19, say 90 to 95, when it launched, we graduated in 87, so we were working on this right away. Um, It only took us $30,000 to to bring it forward. So what does that mean? Be careful with your dollars and cents. Don't give it away so fast. You know, people run off and get, you know, seed money. And you know what you do? You give away your company. Katie and I never gave away a company, not with Rodan and Fields, not with Proactive Solution. And we had a little interim with Estee Lauder, but we bought it back. But by having control, you get to do what you need to do. So that's when you call your mom. Guys, you know, I need I need something. Help me out here. I have a big idea. But don't go looking for investor money early. It's a very big mistake. And, you know, a lot of people lose it all. By the time they really have something really terrific, they're diluted now to very small numbers, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I think that's a great point you make because you hear about these, you know, physician inventors or physician entrepreneurs that by the time it's all set, because some of these things can take years to yes, get off the do. ground, but by the end, they they made very little or no money for all that. And sure, they have helped clinical care, but it's just a shame that, you, you know, why should someone else get rich off your own idea? That's, I think that's an excellent point you make there. I guess the other thing, you know, that goes into all this is marketing and getting, you know, the adoption. Like you said, this was a new product. You guys were one of the first, you know, or the first there. And so how did you convince, you know, essentially the field of dermatology and even just consumers in general to to use your product? Great question, because times have changed. So let's go back, guys. Go back. 1991, two, three, four. Doctors never were on TV. Doctors don't do that. There was a whole different code in the world of medical and integrity. But Katie and I were not interested in in giving our products prescription. That made no sense. You'd get to me eventually. We wanted to treat a problem, uh, help people treat a problem for themselves. Okay, how do you reach them? We went to Neutrogena. We had named it Proactive Solution, had beautiful label. We had stabilized formulas. Uh, all of the, the formulations were proven and, you know, they were perfect. We were ready to sell the concept. In this case, we want to license our idea to Neutrogena because they do marketing. They have shelf space. This is before the internet, guys. So what happened was uh, they said, you'll never walk the halls of dermatology again. They put their arm. Coatson was the, was the president of Neutrogena who had gray hair and gray eyes. And he said, you're going to dance with the devil if you do this deal because dermatologists will be jealous. He was right. He was right. So what happened is Neutrogena held us up for a year. They wanted it, didn't want it. And they, they turned us down, but they gave us an idea. They said, do an infomercial. 
be on TV with a 30 minute opportunity in those days to explain a difficult problem with before and after acne before and after my God, you can't get better than that. So we were prepared. We did our homework. We knew who the best companies were, but we didn't know how to get to them. And then through serendipity, Katie's mom's best friend's aunt is the aunt of Guthy Rinker. It was one of these, those things. They gave us the chance to interview for infomercial, but we went in prepared. And we knew because of our problem solution that infomercial was great. It was the right way to market in this, in that era, um, in that world. It was so different. So it worked out. We did it. They do uh, today's celebrity influencer is, was yesterday's celebrity superstar. And in fact, anybody who touched proactive shot right to the roof. We had Justin Bieber before he made it. We had Jessica Simpson just as she was coming on the scene. We had um, old, older women, Vanessa Williams, who was kind of out of the limelight. She was wonderful. She worked with us for five years. She was extraordinary and her star popped and she became a superstar again. So there was this myth legend that anybody who touched proactive became highly successful. And the reason is integrity. Thanks to Guthy Ranker, they delivered our infomercials with integrity. Yeah, there's sales going on and we doctors hate sales and Katie and I don't sell. We share information and we help people live well. And so we made that clear in the marketing, we don't do that, we don't sell. So, so for us, that was the era. Now, in, now let's go forward. We did our next bunch of products. Guthy Ranker didn't wanna do it, who knew? So Estee Lauder bought us in a second for not much. And then the plan was at full retail, you know, we'll get, you know, part of the, the revenues. Well, guess what? That was about 204 to 207, even before the great recession of 08, you could go bowling in department stores. Nobody was there. Nobody was shopping. And Katie and I figured that out real fast and realized we made a mistake. We ended up buying our pro our products back. So that was a huge event. To, nobody had done that to Estee Lauder, but we knew we, this was gonna be a teeny brand, $10 million, which when you do your numbers, there's nothing there. That's just overhead. So we got it back and we had the courage, and this is what entrepreneurs do. We have courage to try something important. Now let's go back to the reality. Katie and I still were practicing for fun. Katie and I were still doing fine with proactive, but we wanted this time to help people in particular women as that recession was rolling in, be able to have an income, to be able to uh, get personal growth, job growth, skills, et cetera, and to have great skin. Because when this is working, this is everything. This is your calling card to the world. So when this is going well, you can have confidence to get a job, to get a date, to go through school, so Katie and I were compelled to do our own company. But this time I can't point a finger to a, you know, Neutrogena and say, you screwed up. It was all on us. It was all on us. And so we created a team, CEO, C-suite, all of those things that you will learn all about um, and managers and R&D team we created a company. And this time it was all on us. And this time it worked even better than Proactive Solutions. It's extraordinary when you let the people who love and use the product actually sell it. So they have, we have several hundred thousand brand ambassadors, consultants that sell Rodan and Fields products. And they sell it with their calling card, great skin. That's amazing. In a way, you were kind of ahead of your time a little bit with the, you know, the influencer marketing is, I'm way. sure you're aware, is, is so huge now. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's kind of the, you know, having you know, everyday brand ambassadors versus just celebrities is, is kind of the, the new wave right now. Um, I'm curious, you know, what, what was like maybe the biggest thing you learned from proactive that then you turned around and applied to your, your time with uh, Rodan and Fields? Um, I think really there's so many learnings because uh, we learned what they did well and we learned what we didn't like. And that's important because um, for us, again, as physicians, it's about brand integrity and always doing the right thing, the right thing for the customer. Uh, here's a good story, here's a good story. We were walking down in a big exhibition, it was the Academy of Dermatology meeting. And if you guys have what we have, we have 
vendors, rows and rows, selling us lasers and uh, products and this and that, you know, gear. Okay. We were walking with the chairman, the head of dermatology at Stanford. And we're walking along and we're not looking in the big front booths. We're looking on the side booths for interesting ingredients. And we were looking to find things that really work, something really unique, something special in the delivery and vehicle, something. And while walking with him, he goes, you know, I, I've been in this business. I've been a you know chair for uh, decades. I have never walked the floor with an inventor who actually wants real results. When I walk the floor with industry, they want 10% better. They want spary dust. You know, ooh, that's the ingredient du jour, name it. Bukushiol oil, who cares? In other words, they're not looking for the ultimate answer. Business is only looking for money. Us, hold that high guys. We are the ones looking for results. And Katie and I have repeatedly, starting with practice, pulled new products that are not good enough. If they don't perform, we will pull it. And we don't do it often, but that's how important it is. We just did it three months ago, actually. They're still mad at me, but it's okay. Because I don't want you to waste your time using some cream of the week that you have no value for. It just is not going to work for you. So that's the biggest thing is you can maintain your in integrity and you need to do it because forces around you are pulling you the other way. That's interesting. I'm curious, you know, you, as you said, both you and Dr. Rodan maintained your, your clinical practice during this time. Were you, were you either of you the acting CEO or did you bring in others to, to, uh, to run those? And then I guess what's your advice for, you know, for physicians that want to maybe bring in you know, a, a quote unquote business person to, to be their CEO or their, their C-suite uh, people? It's a very good question because you're really flying by yourself. And when you first get your idea, let's go back to mentoring, you know, call people. How'd you do it? You know, who do you suggest? What happens in business is people move in teams. And I see this in my laser companies all the time. The CEO, the CFO, the CMO, COO, all the O's, which would be your operations, your marketing, your finance, your banking guys, your executive who's running the whole show, uh, your marketing team, they move in a pod. They do a startup and then they roll to the next thing. And then they roll to the next thing. And, and that's kind of what's going on out there. So they bring their own team. But experience really matters. And so Katie and I, the first with Proactive, we had a turnkey arrangement. Proactive pumps out, uh, excuse me, got the ranker, pumps out products, all kinds of products. But they have they have all that infrastructure and they just plug your idea into their big wheel so they can manufacture, they do the marketing, they can do the online, you know, they, they're following up on, you know, yes, this infomercial was good, this one didn't hit, and why? All the details. You have no clue what was going on. So that's turnkey. And I recommend it, particularly with the first idea, is uh, you know, you you get it, you professionalize it as far as you can on your own dollar and license it. And then you get a royalty. And so with our contract, which was only six pages with Proactive, unbelievable. It was so clean. If they screwed it up, we got the product back. So they couldn't screw it up. And I have to tell you how brilliant that was. We got a little bit bamboozled with Estee Lauder. They didn't give us six pages. They gave us a two volume set, looked like an encyclopedia for a legal contract. And it was, it had, they had all the power and we had none. So you really need a great attorney you need advisors and you need to uh, see who's done it before and who they recommend because you cannot do this alone. Every entrepreneur needs to be a leader, extremely enthusiastic about what they're doing. If you don't have it, nobody around you will. So you have to be 1000% committed to your vision and you have to know where you're going. You don't know how you're getting there, but you want to know where you want to end up. And you will keep driving to that. So Katie and I took five years to get to proactive. We never gave up. It was very easy to give up. Believe me, very. But the next thing with Estee Lauder, it came almost too fast because we were known. But then I got the encyclopedia legal document. No good. So I tried. But this, the third time we did it ourselves, well, that took our own money. Every penny we made went into the third company, all our risk. That takes real guts, courage, 
and belief, belief in what we were doing. You know, when we went positive, we struggled 07, 8, 9, 10, 11. 2011, cell phones got in the hands of everybody. They're around in 08, but smartphones became a thing in 11, and Facebook created selling on this toy. And so Rodan and Fields went from here to here because of a paradigm shift in direct sales. So timing matters. You know, and then that whole list of mentors matters. Absolutely. Absolutely. So just just so I, I have the details right. So you guys have and have uh exited on proactive and then Rodan and Fields, you you sold it initially to Estee Lauder and then bought it back and now are still running it uh with your team as well. Correct. So that that's right. We got it and it launched it, got it back. And and so it's it's going along. It's a big organization. And you know, we have a terrific partner. We have TPG, so venture capital, they're amazing. And you know, these are big, big operations now. But Katie and I do not run it. We are the founders, but we, because of our interests, are directly involved in research and development and in marketing. That's where we feel we can add value to the company at this point. Excellent. Yeah, I think I've heard kind of the cautionary tales of of the physicians that tried to do it all as entrepreneurs. You know, we in the hospital we we theoretically can do at least we think we can do it all. <laughs> um, there's there's that that's up for debate too. But I think in business you definitely can't, as you have very clearly pointed out, you you can't do it all there. <laughs> Not at all. But just a short list to be recognized by business. They have to trust you. That's not a small word. Because if I'm going to hand you a million dollars, two million, whatever you're, you think you're worth, um, what are you going to do with it? If you're not a really good business person who really understands how to invest that, you're not going to get any money. So you've, number one, you have to be trustworthy. Number two, you have to have your vision well, well defined so anybody can understand it and get on board with it. You need to really, so you need the courage to go forward. You know, for us to go on television, that was terrible. That was shocking. And then for doctors to go direct to consumer after, it hasn't been done. That we were a first. So that's gutsy. And so you have to be able to make that big leap. And you cannot work alone. You absolutely need teams. So you have to have leadership skills. You have to play well with others. And if you're not one of those people that don't doesn't play well with others, then do your thing, license it, and sell it. <laughs> don't don't try to build an empire because it is unlikely that you'll get enough followers uh, to help you make it through. But th- those are the core tenets to even be allowed to play in the game of entrepreneurs. Great, great. W- one last thing I want to ask you about is is you know you you talk about, you know, finding the right partners, the right mentors and things like that. But I want to talk about intellectual property. You know, how, how did you and Dr. Uh, Rodan protect your intellectual property? What's your advice on, you know, making sure that, you know, cause a lot of physicians kind of wonder where to start with that. You know, they're worried about people stealing their ideas and things like that. Well, there's two parts to that. One is first mover advantage. So we could not protect our formulas for road for proactive. Why? Benzoyl peroxide's out there. And if you're a good chemist, you know, in year 10, they finally decided to try to reverse engineer proactive. The deck is right on the bottle. You know, you just gotta figure out the chemistries and stabilize it, not the exact how you cook it, how you fold it. Let me tell you, I'm gonna educate you on formulation. You have pancakes and souffle, almost the same ingredient. We got butter and eggs, maybe a little milk. And then with a pancake, you fry it. With a souffle, you whip it and you bake it, right? Same stuff, a little vanilla, but different outcome. Formulas are the same. Benzoyl peroxide is not benzoyl peroxide. There's many, many versions and the cheap stuff will burn your face off and the really fine stuff may not get absorbed right. And the micro encapsulations, all these kitschy little nuances and formulations can ruin or enhance the formula. So you got to know what you're doing when you formulate for those formulators. So that's just a little sidebar. So we did not patent it. We trademarked it. And because we were so stealth the first decade, nobody paid attention until it wasn't even a decade. We, in 2003, we got a massive award for the cosmetic executive women or CEO, their title was, but anyway, 
those people, Revlon, Neutrogena, L'Oreal, all the big game. And they identified Rodan and Fields for upending uh, a whole market that no one had seen before. But by then it was too late. We had become the Kleenex of acne care. We were the name, you know, better than proactive was the best people could do. But why would you take second best when you could have the real thing? And the price point was fair and reasonable, $19.99, literally a month. So we did, we only trademarked. We had first mover advantage. We moved with speed. We had a turnkey company, spectacular execution. Next company, we went into retail. The opposite, Red Ocean. Everybody was screaming the same thing. The consumer had no idea what worked and what didn't. There wasn't a 30 minute explanation. There wasn't an explanation of ingredient deck. We were just one of another bunch of products in a wall. Garbage, terrible, the worst. No commercial to help me out. No celebrity to stop the channel. So that's why direct to consumer brand ambassador for us worked. So did we patent? We have made many patents along the course of our of Rodan and Fields. And the things that require patenting, we do. And you need to do that, but you still have a short time window. The patent is helpful. IP will help you sell your concept to a big pharma, if that's the plan. But somebody will reverse engineer you quickly. So the patent has to be really airtight. And that takes time to create and then to file. And then is it worldwide rights or just the United States? Depends where you want to sell it. But I promise you, once anyone gets wind that you're doing something very special, they will reverse engineer you. So you have to be fast. And so sometimes in, in an effort for speed, it's better to give that to a, a big pharma that knows what they're doing and move quick rather than try to create that momentum, which is glacial on your own. Because you're right. It's hard to get it in the hands of patients without other sources to get you momentum. Sure, sure. Yeah, and I guess the, the other last thing here is, you know, you've done this uh, rare combination of pr clinical practice and then not just starting one company, but multiple very, very successful companies, multi-billion dollar companies. And I guess what where where did you learn all this business acumen? Is it or what's your advice for that? Like how to pick that up along the way? I mean, obviously, you know, some of it's kind of knowing what you don't know and what knowing what you do know, but I feel like to to play with the business people, you you have to have some type of base knowledge at least. <laughs> you know, that that's almost the easiest question of all because there's so much access in this era to everything. You can go right now to any university and take their business courses. And you don't need all of them. You don't definitely don't need, you know, a fancy Harvard MBA. You need basic language, uh, you know, to understand this new language. It's completely different than what we do. And it's so really any course right now online and that's enough. Uh, Katie and I absolutely learned on the job. We never went to business school at all. But um, but I, I've learned a tremendous amount and because of problems. When you hit you know, a legal issue, you start learning. When you hit a problem with a formulation, you start learning. When you hit a problem with IP and then hiring and firing and, and you know, there's been, when you become bigger, you become a target. And it, that's sort of the scary part that no one talks about. You know, if, if you're Elon Musk, he, everybody's paying attention <laughs> and anything he does will have consequences. So if you're the bigger players out in the world, um, people want to piece you in a bad way. And so that's another thing we had to learn, you know, is, is professionalizing and making sure that everything we do is transparent and, and above board and, you know, all the, the, our, the way our business is run, how many females are on our board, uh, the diversity. These are all areas that, you know, you wouldn't be paying attention to. You're trying to put your head down and make a business. But all of that also comes into play. And that comes in with your team when you have people you're working with, small, who've done several things. So there are people who just do startups. They like doing 10 things and they're pretty good at it. And as you get better, you need to quickly professionalize and get someone who's really the expert in marketing. You can't have your guy doing marketing and operations and field training, et cetera. So, but you start, you start small um, and you keep talking. You keep talking to people who've done it in the area that you're in. Sure, sure. And I, th I think you also make a, a good point that in some ways you just kind of got to go for it. A lot of this is learned, you know, because as a as a business or an entrepreneur, you're 
some of these things you're not you're never going to read it in a book you know or certain certain problems you're never going to foresee and it's like you said it's encountering those problems and then learning how to deal with them i think that's an excellent point <laughs> go for it go for it and you know how do you know when you have the right idea when you can't sleep at night when you are up all night going wow you know i got to do this i got to do this now i got to do mm-hmm. this right now people need this you're on to something that's called your why so it's another book, The Book of Why by Sinek. But nevertheless, read the books. Because <laughs> if you have your why in your head very clear, you will see this to completion. Life is going to happen. You know, marriage, kids, illness, overhead. All of those things are ongoing while you're doing your day doctor job. And in the meantime, you've got a great idea. So if you are not compelled to take every free moment to work on the project, like all of those people who've approached me with really good ideas, they're gone. They just won't happen. So you have to give it the oxygen it needs. And I, and I, that's the test. If you're not up all night thinking about it, it's not there yet. Keep trying. But you have to be, here's the word, compelled. That's how you all got into med school. <laughs> you were compelled to get A+. Plus. Okay. Right. right. That same tenacity, because that's what it's going to take. Nothing less. Excellent. Excellent. So my my last question, I ask everybody this, when you're not practicing dermatology or or running multiple businesses, what, where do you, what are your passions in your, in your spare time? How do you find that balance? If there is one (laughs) balance Um, with joy, I love everything I'm doing. I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm grateful. I'm healthy. I'm grateful. I have a wonderful spouse. I'm grateful. I have two great kids like came out okay through all the pandemic and and what's going on in the world today but my husband and I are a a true team of full partnership and what we do in our free time though we're still working we have everything going on all the time but we're digging deep in philanthropy in projects that are important to us example uh, we've been working with Tulane University on mental health anxiety depression suicide Um, This is a dirty little secret across every campus, every med school in America, say the world. And what we were finding at that university in particular, because our son went there, there were eight suicides on the year we started. Um, And how could this happen? What is going on? The happiest school on earth and nobody's really happy. And so what we invested in is a design thinking program. We pull that into actionable programming that the university can deploy and to change the community that we're all for each other now. We gotta care for each other, have eyes on each other. And we can make a real difference in that kid, in that dorm room who shut the door and then died. We're gonna open that door because we have people on the ground now. Everybody's looking out for everybody. They're really doing what they should be doing. And what that does, it brings in conversation, community. Let's agree on what we can agree on instead of this divisive world that we're living in. So that's just one example of the many, many projects we're involved in. And we don't write checks, we get in and do the work. So, so that's so exciting, so stimulating to be on the front of a conversation and being the change you want to see and not being complicit and just saying, well, kids die at school. We, we didn't stand by with that. And we've been working this problem now probably almost a decade. Wow. That's amazing. You know, no, I commend you for, you know, on top of everything else you're doing to to take on such a, a, a serious issue that, you know, affects so many different people and bringing it to light. I think that's amazing. You know, it, it, it's gratitude and compelling. And so we're up all night talking about, you know, huh, could we do that better? Who do we talk to, et cetera, and building coalitions, people around us all with the same big goals. That's how things happen. That's amazing. Amazing. Well, Dr. Fields, thank you so much for taking time on your very busy day and for all you've done for, you know, for medicine and, and the you know community at large. Really appreciate it. Um, I guess the last thing is where, where can people either find out more about you or find out more about, you know, what you're working on and, and uh, get involved? Uh, you know, uh, that's a good question. I, I'm kind of all over the place. Find me in my medical office, probably the, the easiest. And that's just here in San Francisco. I'm just writing the book. <laughs> definitely find me <laughs> awesome awesome well thank you again we really appreciate it all right well thank you for your time thank you for listening to this episode of the da vinci hour podcast 
presented by DaVinci Academy. Please be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow the podcast on your podcast platform of choice to catch the latest episodes. Please leave a comment or review and share it with a friend. Lastly, you can find all of our podcasts, video courses, and books on our website, dviacademy.com. Thank you for listening.